Hey AP Chemsters, this is Mrs. Vandewally. I'm bringing another edition of the Blank Wall series. Uh, We're in chapter 13, which is all about equilibrium. I just want to make sure you understand what equilibrium really means. Um, that is where you have um, forward and reverse reactions going on at the same time. Uh, very few reactions actually go on to completion. A lot of your combustions do. Um, but most of your, your equations that we've been talking about really all year long, uh, the, the reactants collide and make products, but the products can collide with each other and form the reactants right back. So that's the idea of equilibrium. So it's like a vessel that has all products and reactants in the same container, and they're just colliding, and eventually they're going to reach an equilibrium where the amount of uh, products, the amount of reactants are going to remain constant. So having said that, let's go on to section 13.4. Uh, conditions of a heterogeneous equilibria. What, well, what does heterogeneous mean? We learned that back when we talked about solutions. We had homogeneous solutions and, and heterogeneous. And we said heterogeneous is not the same throughout. So that's what heterogeneous means, it's not the same. So how does that apply to equilibrium? Well, we're talking about the states of matter. Uh, the position of the heterogeneous equilibrium does not depend on the amounts of pure solids or pure liquids at present. So, so what's left? Well, it has to be your gases or your solutions. Um, so it says if pure solids or liquids are involved in chemical reaction, their concentrations are not included. Well, think about it. How will you have concentrations anyway? Uh, moles of solute over um, the liters of solution. Uh, if you have a pure solid or a pure liquid, you're not really having those conditions being met, so we don't talk about that. Um, so pure liquids are not the same as solutions whose concentrations can change. So the moles of the uh, solute over the volume of the solution. So problem 10, consider the following equilibrium reaction. Uh, we're talking about ammonium in water and making ammonia and hydroxide. There are the concentrations, so go ahead and, and write down what you think the constant Kc is for this reaction. Pause your, your computer, and then I'll be right back with the answer. Okay, so um, let's see how you did. Here is the answer. Um, notice I did not put water in the denominator with, with the ammonium. Well, why not? Because water is a pure liquid. How are you going to have a mole solute over liters of solution when it's just pure water? Notice that everything that was aqueous is included because you can talk about molarity with that. And so you have K is 0 0.024. Hope I did my math right. And according to this, um, I know it wasn't asked in the question, but how is it going to shift? Is it going to shift to the right or shift to the left? Are you going to favor, not sorry, shift, but is it going to favor the products or is it going to favor the reactants? And in this case, look at the value. It's a very small number. It's less than one. Um, we're going to favor the reactants. So you're going to have actually more ammonium present in this uh, system than you will ammonia and hydroxide. So let's go ahead and go to the next page and see what's up. All right, so it says problem number 11, write the expressions for the K, which is the concentration, and the KP, which is the pressure for the following processes. So go ahead and write down the reactions for A, B, and C, and go ahead and write your Ks and KPs, and turn, uh, pause your computer, and I'll be right back with the answers. Okay, hopefully you got them all done. So the first part is, what is the, um, first of all, the reaction with the phosphorus uh, uh, pentachloride here? It's a solid. Well, there's the reaction. And um, notice it's a solid making a pure liquid and chlorine gas. So the only thing that you would put in this equilibrium expression is the chlorine gas. So note here is your K is the concentration of your gas and KP is the pressure of your chlorine gas. I'll raise the first because your coefficient is a one. Now you may wonder, how can you have a concentration of a gas? Same idea, moles of the gas per liter of, in a sense, your container. So you can have a concentration expressed in moles per liter of a gas. Uh, for part two, let's scroll down here. Uh, we have the solid copper two sulfur uh, sulfate pentahydrate. And typically when we have 
uh, these uh, hydrates, there should be a dot in between the sulfate and the water here. And that's how you, you write down a, a, a hydrate formula. And so typically you drive off the water by heating it. And so what we are left is with the copper sulfate and five waters. Um, notice again, you have solids and you have a gas. You have water vapor. So typically water liquid, you don't put in the equation, but if you have water vapor, you will. So what is our expressions? Well, you're gonna raise the concentration of the fifth and the pressure to the fifth. And then you did your calcium carbonate, I hope. So again, this is another decomposition. We have two solids. They don't get included in the equilibrium expression. The gas will. So notice they are also raised to the first. Uh, go ahead now and do your problem number 12 where you have um, a whole bunch of stuff. You have iron and, and gaseous water going on and actually calculate Kp for the reaction. Now read the question very carefully. They did not tell you the pressure of the hydrogen gas, um, but you can certainly figure it out. So pause your computer, figure it out, and I'll be right back at you. All right, so notice that um, this time we have our Kp expression with the pressure of hydrogen gas raised to the fourth over the pressure of water vapor raised to the fourth. Uh, that 21.3 came from the fact that the total pressure is 36, or yeah, 36.3. I subtracted 15 from that because that was your water pressure, and um, that's where I got the 21.3. So you raise everything to the fourth, you get 4.14. So go ahead and let's turn to the next page and um, start the next section. All right, so this is applications of the equilibrium constant. And um, I, I can't emphasize enough that I'd really like you to open up your books and read page 591 and 592 carefully. There's a lot of good diagrams going on there, and I think it will make a whole lot more sense if you actually read those two pages in your book. So go ahead and pause your computer if you have your, your, your book, and go ahead and read those two pages. If you don't have your book, make sure you do when you have your book. Okay, well, hopefully you've had time to read those two pages, so let's talk about uh, what they're talking about. So the extent of a reaction. Uh, this, again, talks about to um, if a reaction goes to completion. So reactions with huge uh, equilibrium constants, that's where K is much, 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 much greater than 1, will go to completion. This is like your combustions will do that. A lot of times if um, you have a, a solid being formed, you have a huge K equation, and that typically uh, will, will go to completion, but not always as we're going to find out in, in future chapters. Also, the uh, large negative delta E. So if we go down here, let's scroll down. And so this E down here is what we're talking about, not the activation energy, but if you have a big delta E down here, that typically means that uh, the reactions will also essentially go to completion. Think about that. A negative E is exothermic. Your combustion reactions are very exothermic, and they're the ones that we think of that will go to completion. Um, uh, Hank also made a comment in Crash Course where he's talking about Gibbs free energy is tied in with this K value. We will see that in uh, Chapter 16. So we have a couple more chapters to go where we'll talk about the relationship between E and, and the K value. Now reactions with very, very small equilibrium constants, well, you'll have mostly reactants. Uh, so we'd say the equilibrium position is far to the left. That's where your reactants are. Now, the, the time required to achieve equilibrium, hey, that goes back to our, equ our, our, our kinetics chapter. And our kinetics is what was tied in with this activation energy. So we cannot predict, based on K alone, how fast the reaction goes. We can if we had activation energy discussions, but that is not related to K. So don't confuse kinetics with equilibrium. So we have something called the reaction quotient. And what's happening is that if you have an initial set of concentrations, 
we can predict, is this going to shift to the right where we're going to favor our products? Is it going to shift to the left where we're going to favor our reactants? Or, hey, did you happen to pick the exact amount of, of concentrations where you're already going to be at equilibrium and the, the amounts will no longer change? So the Q is your, your reality in a sense and your K is where nature will end up. So we have the same kind of idea. It's the same law of mass action. We take your products over your reactants again. And um, notice that in this case, Q has those little knots, those little zeros by them, and that means your initial conditions. So if Q is equal to K initially, um, the system is at equilibrium, no shift will occur. But look what happens um, if, if Q is not equal to K. So if you remember, Q is equal to, in a sense, products over reactants. And I'm going to just kind of write that down real quick. So if Q is uh, bigger than K, we need to make Q smaller. So how can we make Q smaller? Well, if we decrease the amount of products and increase the amount of reactants, just based on your mass theory, your math theory, that you can reduce the Q, so it'll equal K. So how are you going to reduce products and increase reactants? You're going to shift to the left. So you're going to use up more products and make more reactants. But what if Q is less than K? That means Q's got to get bigger now. Nature is going to force the system so that Q is going to increase so that it will equal K. Well, how is Q going to get bigger? Go back to your math theory. How can I make Q get bigger? Well, whoa, your products are going to have to get bigger and your reactants are going to have to get smaller. Sorry, that was my cat walking across my keyboard. So here we have products over reactants. So we need to increase our products and decrease our reactants so that Q um, can get to that K value. So it's going to shift to the right, making a, a fewer reactants because they are going to create more products. So let's go ahead and uh, go to the next page and see what we need to do. All right, so problem number 13. Uh, they are saying that a reaction quotient for the system is 7.2 times 10 to the second. That's 720. I put that down there. So if the equilibrium constant for the system is 36, what's going to happen as the equilibrium is approached? So keep in mind, Q is bigger than K. Q has to get smaller uh, so that we'll reach the K value. So how is that going to happen? Pause your computer and let's see what the answer is. Okay, so what did you say? So if Q has to get smaller, you're going to have to shift to the left and favor the reactant. So again, if Q is equal to products over reactants, how am I gonna make this number get smaller? P has to get smaller, R has to get bigger, and that's letter B, shift to the left. Go ahead and do problem number 14 now. Okay, so here you have um, some quantities, and if you do your math right, you're gonna find out that uh, Q is equal to 0.246. Compare that to your K value up here. And you'll notice that Q once again is greater than K. So we're going to have to reduce the amount of, of products and increase the amount of reactants. So it's going to shift again to the equilibrium uh, or shift to the left so it will reach equilibrium. Uh, problem number 15 I already set up the equation for you and wrote down the Q value. Go ahead and um, through each A, B, and C, calculate your Q and see what you need to do. Turn off your computer, or uh, pause your computer, and let's see. Okay, hopefully you had time to work on this. Let me scroll this up so you can see my answers here. So by plugging in the values of, of the uh, concentrations of the three different uh, things from the Haber process, you will see where I get my Q values. Here we go. So in letter A, Q is much bigger than the K, which is 0 0.060. So Q needs to get much smaller. How do I decrease the value of Q? Uh, I need to decrease the products, increase your reactants, and so it's going to shift to the left. Uh, letter B, uh, the Q is practically equal to K, so it's, it's at equilibrium. There will be no shift. It's already, you happen to pick an exact amount of quantities uh, where Q will equal K. 
Finally, Q in letter C is less than K, so you need to increase uh, Q value. You're going to do that by increasing the amount of products, reducing the amount of uh, reactants, and it's going to shift to the right. So that is really um, concluding what section 13.4, 13.5 is all about. Uh, go ahead and check Schoology for problems out of your book. I uh, made copies of them for you, and we'll see you tomorrow.